Good morning, friends. What a beautiful message today about gifts and the many gifts that we have, so, so different from one another, but all so important. <laughs> Who would ever think <laughs> that we have so many different gifts, all God-given, all working for the glory of God and making it such a positive impact in this world? Who would have known that our music director would be hula hooping as part of our message? It was hula hoop degrees out this morning. It was hula hoop degrees out this morning. Ten years ago, people might have, well, I don't know, maybe yesterday, people might have said, what? What are they doing hula hooping in there? But there are many gifts, all very valuable, all God-given through God's grace. And emerging out of a season of gift giving, our passage today in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 provides a different take on the concept of giving and receiving gifts. We might even paraphrase Paul's message today with this first sentence that says, therefore, since you have received many gifts, what are you going to do with them? In this cold, cold, cold January, this post-gift-giving month, we're reminded that gifts are received as a very act of God's grace. And this is so very different to us than the very tangible holiday gift-giving and receiving. We tend to use that idea of the Santa Claus model of delivering gifts solely for our individual purposes and enjoyment as our norm. But our reading from Corinthians of spiritual gifts gives us a divine image of a giver who bestows gifts through grace. And those gifts are meant to contribute to the common good, to the common good of a whole community and a manifestation of the spirit. Imagine, we are all given through the grace of God, gifts intended not to make us better for our own selves, maybe not to make us better in our workplace for personal development or a bigger paycheck, but we're given gifts for the benefit of the whole community. And every single person, everyone, is a recipient of gifts. What a concept. What a concept indeed. Understanding the context of Paul's letter, he begins his letter with now concerning, and it tells us that Paul was responding to something. We don't know if Paul was responding to a question that the Corinthians had for him, or if he was responding to an experience of um, the Corinthians that he observed or others had, had observed. We don't know all the details of exactly what was going on, but what we do know when we, can, when we look at the book of 1 Corinthians as a whole, which we often need to do to understand any particular piece of scripture, we can see back in chapter 1, verse 10, what looks like the background of this letter, kind of like the summary statement when in chapter 1, verse 10, Paul's right, now I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. Throughout 1 Corinthians, we can see and hear, if we were to listen for that, a church that might have been challenged, a church that might have been having a hard time being church. So this appeal for unity and the elimination of divisions gives us this background that we need for really understanding chapter 12 that we're reading today where Paul talks about how unity can happen even in the midst of radical differences. Points to the purpose of this passage is the celebration of diversity and difference. Paul goes to great lengths in this passage to illustrate that all spiritual gifts are worthwhile and all gifts are inspired by the same spirit. And that's a lot to take in if we're honest. Challenge number one. I have a series of six challenges for you today. Challenge number one. 
to believe that gifts are real. First, there's the acknowledgement on our own behalf, that acknowledgement when you look in the mirror, that you can look in the mirror and acknowledge and appreciate and see that God has given you many gifts. Sometimes that's the hardest thing to do. So many people I talk to and experience don't see their own value, don't believe that God has gifted them with something important. Challenge number one, believe in yourself. Believe in the God that created you, that that same God has given you many gifts. Challenge number two, God has given other people many gifts. And sometimes, under the same vein as um, when I tell you that you've never looked into the face of another human being that God doesn't love, I can tell you that God has given every single person gifts, even when it's very difficult to see them in others as well. Sometimes those gifts are different, or maybe sometimes the gifts in another person, much like ourselves, aren't yet understood, aren't yet identified by the receiver. But how do we embrace the differences? It's easy for me to embrace Dave's hula hooping, although I can't really hula hoop or at least wouldn't try in front of a crowd. Sometimes though, the gifts of our friends and neighbors aren't as easy to embrace. And yet we must. To really deal with differences, we have to acknowledge that it isn't God's idea in creation that we're all cookie cutter people, that we're all the same, or that we're meant to be the same. We're all different, and we're different by design. It's one of the things I love about this church is that we aren't one denomination. We're three, at least, and probably in reality, many more, because there are many of us here from many different faith backgrounds, and we bring a little bit of those backgrounds with us. I love that. I love that by design, at our very core, we don't have one way of being. I love that by design, the United Methodists and the United Church of Christ are at different beliefs than the American Baptists about baptism. I love that. I love, as a UCCer, when Harris and Brian asked me to baptize him, who happens to be here today, in the river, and I really had no idea how to do it, truth be told, because that's not been my experience from my tradition. But I learned how to do that, and I loved doing that. And then I did the same for Peter and others. I love that we're different. I love that we acknowledge each other's understandings and beliefs without looking for right and wrong, without trying to shoulder up and diminish the values and experiences of another person. That's what happens when we start to move and grow as a community of one. And we move before us, beyond excuse me, these ideas of forced uniformity to actually embrace unity. We aren't guided by a set of rules or a rule book, and we don't see scripture as a book of rules. We're guided by Christ, and we're different from one another. We have different ideas, different skills, different gifts, different passions. We have different things that we want to see, different things that we want to hear and to experience. We have different hopes and different dreams. But through all of that, we need one another. Because being different, again, is actually God's design. Challenge number three, unity. In the midst of differences and divisions and struggles, and Lord knows we have a lot of those to deal with lately, how do we even talk about unity? It's hard to find it right now. In conversation after conversation, I'm experiencing an opportunity where I see and experience people boiling one another down to one belief or another. 
as if a whole person's value is based on their vaccination status or their political party or their beliefs about abortion, their beliefs about capital punishment, their beliefs about LGBTQ. We create these divisions amongst us and boil our brothers and sisters, humanity, God's creation, God's beloved creation, down to a set of beliefs. And that's not God's intention for our lives. We're called to build community. We're called to move away from believing that our way is the only way. We're called to move away from seeing our brothers and sisters from different faith traditions as wrong or not quite getting to heaven. If we believe that God is for us, the question I have, then who's not us? Who's on the other side of that us? I think that us includes us all. I was raised in a Catholic tradition and the experience of my experience there in that time was that if you weren't Catholic, you weren't really Christian. I'm not saying that that was what was taught necessarily directly by the church, but that was what I experienced growing up. And as I understood that that faith tradition wasn't for me, and I understand now exactly why, of course, but I didn't know why yet, and as I understood it wasn't for me, I was left not knowing what to do. I didn't know where to go. Because when I grew up, every other church that wasn't the Catholic church was considered weird. One of those churches. Most recently, my daughter shared with me as she was in a carpool with some friends, a woman who I thought was a friend, as they passed by my church, this church, our church, oh, there's my mom's church. Well, that's not a real church. That really hurt a lot. Are we not a real church? Hello? Hello? We're a real church? Amen. Thank you, David. <laughs> David has a gift of awareness there. Yeah, on the <laughs> We're a real church. I pray for that person to see beyond those restrictions that she was taught in her faith tradition. And I pray for us to do the same. Because in truth and honesty, I suspect she's not alone. We might draw our lines differently, but yet lines are drawn just the same. Unity and diversity in all things. So living out, challenge number four, living out this unity thing. When living in unity, we create places of building up, not tearing down at church, at home, at work, in community, wherever it is. We can take this message that Paul has given us, and it's in all aspects of our life. It's just not on Sunday when you're at church or when you're at the board committee meeting or whatever committee meeting you're at at church or working in the food pantry. It's everywhere, in all times, in all places. We create places where we can actually imagine and believe that Christ is truly present and listening to our conversations. (gasps) Imagine that. Imagine being in a place where we wouldn't be worried that Jesus was listening to our conversation. I used to, (laughs) my sister, I love her. Uh, I'm the pastor, but we call her the church lady. She goes, she was, we were raised Catholic and she goes to mass every day. And don't we love to go to the Christian bookstore together? And we both came home with the same sign. And I, I, you know, like, you know, the little signs that my kids have now said, stop, (laughs) stop decorating our house with Guatemala stuff or scripture signs. Like, I'm done with that. So, you know, before I got that directive, it was something like, um, 
I forget the exact wording of the sign, but it was basically, it was like in the shape of a house and it said, you know, Christ is a member of this family and at every conversation, at every dinner table, whatever, like Christ is everywhere and Christ is listening. <laughs> and it really did give you a different perspective. Like we, <laughs> I did have to move that sign along, but um, it might've went to the thrift store, I'm not sure. But I make fun, but truly, would you want Christ to hear your conversations? How do we build a community where we're fine with that, we're good with that? Living in community, living in unity, we live a life that's a life beyond ourselves, where we live to help, to serve, to listen, to create communities of compassion and love for one another. Living out unity. I feel like I'm giving you the challenges as a to-do list without giving you lots of instruction on how. That's something that you have to, first of all, want to do. First you have to think, do I want to live in unity? Think about the people that you feel most pulled away from, most resistant to. That's what I'm talking about. Living in unity with them. So the first thing is the desire of the heart. The reminder that all things are possible with God. And each day is a new day. As you try to move forward in that way. And challenge number five, why? Why is any of this important? Why is it that we take and experience our gifts, acknowledge them, experience them, tune them, use them for growth in our community, for the common good, to live in unity, to serve, to be? Why? Why would we do it? What's the point? Probably it's the most important part of this conversation is the why. We employ gifts for love. Gifts, talents, and ability coming as they do from God are the sources of excellence in our lives. And as I said earlier, if we take this passage from chapter 12 and apply the whole book of 1 Corinthians, right? Look through the whole book. What's really going on here? We also have 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And you know it, right? You know what I'm talking about? At least a nod. At, at, at home, I can't see you right now, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's probably one of the most known pieces of Scripture, most often read pieces of Scripture. You could probably find it at Marshall's and Walmart, written on a little plaque, on a pillow, on a blanket, in a card. It's probably in most Hallmark cards, if you've ever seen that. If I went to, Ho I went to Hobby Lobby yesterday, it was everywhere. It's when Paul speaks of love. As he begins to discuss the importance of love, he says, I will show you still a more excellent way that begins uh, the ending of chapter 12, moving into uh, chapter 13. 13. For the greatest of these is love. Chapter 13, verse 13. If I exercise every wondrous gifts of God's spirit but do not have love, says Paul, I'm nothing. This scripture is read at weddings, and I read it at almost every single funeral. Because at the end of our days, what really matters is how we were loved and how we have loved others. I believe 1 Corinthians 13, Paul's conversation about love, is actually a perfect manifesto for our lives. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. We do what we do. We put the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, those first verses into the context of love, which leads us to my final challenge for you, challenge number six. 
And that challenge for you this morning on this cold January day is to move beyond life and church as an observer. To move out and to step in as a participant. To move beyond consumption to contribution. To move beyond criticism to construction. To move beyond mere association to connection. To use church as an example of this for all of life, but using church as an easy one, I offer you this. Association says, I go to church. Connection says, I'm part of a community. Association says, we have shared interests and beliefs. Connection says, we have shared lives. Association says, I can be critical from the outside. I wish Patty's sermons were a little shorter. Connection says, I'm going to work towards contribution from the inside, and maybe I'll preach one day. Okay, that's, I added that in. <laughs> Association says, oh, I know. Connection says, I love, and I'm committed. When we start to embrace the reality that life is we and not just me, that is when we start really living into God's desires for our lives. May it be so, my friends. May it be so. Amen.